Well, it's great to be with you. It really is. Thanks for tuning in. And um, as we spend a few minutes just looking into the Word of God, I trust that God will bless you as he blesses me as we look together into this passage in Acts chapter 16. Now, of course, the book of Acts is in the New Testament. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That's the story of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his rising again. Then the book of Acts is really how the first Christians took the gospel message out throughout the then known world. And I suppose the central figure... I suppose you'd have to say God is the central figure, but the central human character is the Apostle Paul. He's converted early on in the book of Acts, and then we find his life as he goes on three great missionary journeys. Poor old Paul, he's always in bother. I often think, you know, and I go to a new town, I might be wondering what my accommodation's going to be like, who I'm staying with, will I be in a and b or a hotel, what will it be like? I think when the Apostle Paul arrived at a new town, he must have thought, hmm, I wonder what the local prison's like, I'll be there tonight. I wonder if the prison warden will look after me well. And he always was in trouble. And I want to read from Acts chapter 16. This is Paul in Philippi. And of course there the first European convert has, 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 has been brought to faith in Christ. That was a lady called Lydia. But uh, the impact of Paul's preaching in, in, in Philippi was so great that he ends up in prison. Let me, let me read um, the passage. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison. When it says them, it's the Apostle Paul and his friend Silas, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptised. And so it goes on, there's rejoicing, etc. What a story. Paul and Silas been preaching, there been people converted. The, the, the local town leaders didn't like this. They had Paul and Silas beaten, thrown into the prison. I think I might have felt, hmm, a little bit of self-pity is all right now. I think I would have gone on a pity party, don't you? I'd been beaten, I'm in prison. All I was doing is doing what God told me to do. And, but not Paul and Silas, they're greater stuff than that. They're, they're, they're rejoicing, they're praising God, they're singing hymns. I don't know what the other prisoners thought, but anyway, they're, they're rejoicing. It, they felt worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. And then this earthquake this shaking and, and, and suddenly the, the walls begin to crumble, the gates are open and the prison officer, knowing that if any prisoners escaped, whatever punishment was due for them would come to him, the prison officer, rather than go through the humiliation of being executed by the Romans, draws his sword and he's about to thrust himself on the sword. Uh, now again, <laughs> I think if I'd been Paul, I would might have thought, hmm, he deserves it. But not Paul. He shouts out, hey, don't do yourself any harm, we're all here. And he comes and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I love the fact that he's the one who comes trembling to Paul and Silas. You'd normally expect it to be Paul and Silas who are trembling, but no, it's the prison officer who's trembling as he comes to them. And they say, look, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And, and he, he, he did, and his family were, were converted, they were baptised, they ate together, they rejoiced together, and he teaches them the word of God. It, it's marvellous. Now, what I want to speak about for these few minutes is simply this. I'll, I'll tell you what, you, you complete the sentence with me, okay? I want to speak on, what must I do to be... Now, what's the next question? What's the next word, rather? What must I do to be... Well, I imagine most of you have said something like, what must I do to be saved? But no, <laughs> I want to speak for a few minutes on what must I do 
to be asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Because it's all right reading it in Acts chapter 16. This was God doing a marvellous work in Philippi and this Philippian jailer is going to be saved and we know the story, we rejoice in it. But I have to ask myself, when was I last asked, what must I do to be saved? So what must I do to be asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And if you're a Christian today, you will have in your heart a desire to tell others about the Lord Jesus. To do it winsomely, to do it lovingly, but nevertheless to share Christ because we recognise that all around us are men and women who are lost and in desperate need of Jesus. Those who are without Christ are without hope, aren't they? So what must I do to be asked the question? Well, let's look at the Apostle Paul. First of all, he knew he was in the place that God wanted him to be in. Do you remember? He was thinking of going elsewhere. And then he had the Macedonian call, come over and help us. And so instead of following his own natural planning, which was probably very good, instead he says, no, 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 I'll go where God wants me to go. And I've been clearly called to go. I'm going to, 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 to Philippi. And I think we do need to just come before God and, and at times just say, God, just remind me, Lord, that I am where you'd have me be. I, 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 I want to go on your errands. I want to speak your words. I want to do what you'd have me do. Lord, I want to be in the position that you'd have me be. Now, some of us perhaps can look back on life and think, well, we made mistakes. God called us to this or that and we didn't follow. But God's well able to overrule that. Lord, today, I want to be where you'd have me be. That might mean uprooting. In, um, in Leeds, oh, it must be 20 years ago now, there was a man aged 64 and he believed when he read um, a missionary magazine that he should leave work and go and help as an odd job man in Africa. And he got in touch with the missionary organisation and they said, well, you're absolutely ideal, but of course, if you stayed another 18 months, you'd get a pension, wouldn't you? And uh, maybe that would be wiser. But he talked, he prayed with the missionary society and with his church and he believed no. God was calling him now, never mind the pension, God was calling him now to go and give himself a missionary service. Three weeks before he was due to go, he was diagnosed with liver cancer and he actually died. He never made it to the mission field. But how pleased he was that he'd obeyed and said, God, this is what you want me to do. Never mind settling my future with my pension, etc. I want to do now what you'd have me do. And then secondly, the Apostle Paul Yes, he, he knew he was where God wanted him to be, but he was doing what God wanted him to do. For him, of course, it meant he was preaching the gospel. Some people are given the tremendous privilege of being able to spend all their waking hours, as it were, preparing, praying and proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many others, and I think those others are the ones very often on the front line of the battle, many others are in secular employment, teaching, in an office, in a factory, working outside, working in a situation which isn't particularly conducive for the gospel. And yet there you are, as somebody who belongs to the Lord, and you love the Lord, and you're doing your work in a way that honours the Lord, and you're there as a missionary. I suppose everybody really is a missionary or a mission field, and you're there as a missionary. And you're doing what God would have you do. Perhaps be a good engineer. Perhaps be a good student, a diligent student. Whatever it is, a good nurse and then waiting for the opportunities which God will open up for you to speak and drop in a little word, sow a bit of gospel seed wherever you are. And then thirdly, he was proclaiming the message that God wanted him to proclaim. There are temptations, I think we all face them at times as Christians, there are temptations, aren't there, to, as it were, slightly dilute the, the, the strong impact of the gospel. There are some wonderful truths in, in, in the Bible, it's marvellous things about God and the gospel, but there are some things that we find a little bit, how can I put it, unpalatable. Do we want to warn people about hell? Do we want to say that God hates sin? Do we want to speak about judgment? Ooh, something within us sort of recoils from this, doesn't it? And yet God wants us to be faithful. We don't know better than God, so let's simply share God's message. That's what the Apostle Paul did as he first met that prayer meeting by the riverside in, in Philippi. And that's what he did when he was in the prison, having preached the gospel and seen such great fruits. And, and he's still there sharing the gospel with the prison officer. Let's seek to be faithful, loving. 
Remember, non-Christian people are not our enemies. They may be the enemies of God, but they're not our enemies. And even if they were, we're commanded to love our enemies. They are as we once were. We want them to be as we are. So we love them. And we point them to the Lord Jesus Christ as lovingly, winsomely, faithfully, prayerfully as we possibly can. So, he was where God wanted him to do to be, rather. He was doing what God wanted him to do and he was proclaiming what God wanted him to proclaim. And then he took the opportunity. Every single morning when I pray, I pray, God, would you open up doors of opportunity for me to be able to speak to people? And sometimes they come very naturally. Sometimes ooh, it's a little bit harder. I came from the north today by train. I'm afraid I didn't do very well on the train talking to people. I slept most of the way. <laughs> and there were just two ladies sitting opposite. I had a little word, but nothing of great substance. But then I was just sorting out my ticket. And um, the man behind the counter, as it were, blasphemed using the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, I said something like, oh, do you know, he's very precious to me. And I had a little word. The man laughed and he said, you've made a very good point. And I gave him a little gospel leaflet. And he said, you give me something to think about today. It was from nothing and maybe it wasn't anything much, but it was something little. I remember my wife and I were once trying to cross a busy road in, in Wakefield and we just couldn't get across, there was traffic, etc. And there was a man on the other side of the road, he was trying to cross and eventually he just lost patience and he put out his hand like this, walked in front of the traffic that streaked to a halt and came right next to us and we were sort of looking at him as if to say, don't know how you dare do that. And he just turned and said, cars everywhere, I bet there are cars in the Sahara Desert. That's what he said to us. I just turned and said, Sir, I'll tell you where there aren't any cars. And he said, where's that? I said, Sir, there are no cars in heaven. And if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you could go there. And he stopped in his tracks. This is what he said to me. I reckon he was about 64, 65. He just said, I'm just coming from burying my 96-year-old mother. And she was always telling me that. And I said, Sir, tell me more about her. And sure enough, she was a believer. But he had never come to trust Christ. From nothing, the most wonderful conversation happened. And when we're saying, God, I'm just a vessel. There's nothing particularly special. But we go out into the day where God would have us be, doing what he'd have us do, speaking what he'd have us speak. And we just look for those moments. Do you know God will send them along? John Chapman, the Australian evangelist, says, start by just chatting with everybody. Well, we folk in Yorkshire, we do chat with everybody, whether it's in a supermarket or a busky or whatever. If you live in the south of England, it's a little bit harder, I know. But just be chatty, chirpy, even a little bit cheeky. But then look for opportunities to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may find that in time, somebody will turn and say, what must I do to be saved? They may not quite phrase it like that. But how do I get right with God? How can I have what you've got? How can I know what you know? How can I become a Christian? Pray that God would use you in the wonderful ministry of sharing the gospel. We live in very needy days and we have a message that is a blessing to anybody, everybody, whatever their need, if they'll simply turn from their own ways and trust the Jesus who loved them, died for them and rose from the dead. Sir, what must I do to be saved? Lord, Give us people who will ask us that question, we pray.